Yes, uh, Stephen. Our schools are supposed to actually go back either on Tuesday or Wednesday, and we've moved it down back to Monday the 18th of uh, January provisionally, depending on what the minister and the government tells us on Friday the 15th regarding what is happening with lo uh, level three lockdown. I mean, so you are waiting for them. Are you concerned that there could be it could be dangerous to actually resume now? Not really. I think that because of uh, our experiences in our membership last year, we've had extensive experience in actually operating under COVID conditions. So I think that once schools do open, our protocols are in place, there's an understanding of social distancing, and actually every single day there's been constant um, a screening of students. And also what has happened is that when there has been somebody found to be positive, the schools have been managed to, to isolate those people and that class, and actually we have not had a lot of transmissions coming out of schools. Um, do you believe then that your teachers have, have been safe? I mean, is it safe for your teachers to go back to work? Certainly so. I think that, Stephen, what we have learned is that obviously the previous strain was not as infectious or as, as, uh, as effective. It did not affect children as much as it did. Uh, it seems that the second strain does. And certainly what we have seen is that we also believe that maybe the transmission will not be as large from children to adults. But actually, if we continue with our social distancing and the protocols that actually existed, we think that we can minimize uh, the transmission levels in schools. And I think that we are pleased that uh, certainly as ISASA, we have not heard um, of many people succumbing to the disease uh, during this time. And obviously the numbers are very high, around 22,000. It's, a, it's such a complex thing. There's so many different things to take into account. I would say education is one of the most complex issues of governance when it comes to the pandemic. But one of the things that we can do now is that your, your schools particularly have embraced online education, in some cases a sort of hybrid model, in some cases online only classes. Is it possible now to assess how well it's actually worked? And what I'm saying is, and I know your metric results haven't yet been published and we don't know what they will tell us, but is it possible, have you had any feedback, even anecdotally, on how well children have done at the end of last year, if they may be moving from, say, grade 10 to grade 11 or whatever, when they've spent most of the time at home studying online, as many as your learners have? Look, what we're really pleased about is that last year, what we did work very hard as an association is to make sure that our schools could continue with teaching and learning. So all schools are now quite familiar with a hybrid model, either going online or using WhatsApp for, for teaching and learning. I must admit though, some children did absolutely fine, but a lot of children struggled with online learning. So really for our perspective, government has indicated that they want schools to open. We stand with government because for the vast majority of children, being in school is the, most, is the best place to be. Okay, it's interesting because I mean, some of your members are now offering on, online only courses. I mean, is this going to be part of the future of private education? I mean, some of them, uh, I mean, these are big names, I understand it, that are doing this, but in quite an affordable way. I mean, almost on a par with some of the more expensive government schools. Certainly, I think that what we are seeing is that, look, post-COVID, a hybrid model is here to stay. Stephen, before this time, what would happen is that often, you know, education has something has got trends and people are talking about, oh, we've got a hybrid model, uh, we've got flipped classrooms. Well, COVID has forced us to actually implement that. So now, for example, school reports are not going to be physical and schools had already moved in that direction. So they're all going to be, uh, schools are going to, um, you know, each student is going to have a portal. There will be online classes of some form or another during this time. So there's absolutely no question um, that um, online is here to stay. Many of our schools, as you've indicated, have already begun to offer online classes. And one of our big schools, two of our members is actually opening up online schools. For a South African perspective, actually, we need we are approaching government because we do not have a regulatory system for online schools. So there's no regulatory system for online schools. It makes all sorts of things quite complicated. I mean, it's all right if everyone writes the same exam at the end of it all, but you kind of need some regulation, a system of qualifications along the way, some framework. I mean, without it, you can't really do it, can you? 
we actually, you know, interestingly enough, online schools have existed and they found ways to actually do the assessments with, uh, with statutory bodies. But I think that what is really um, concerning is that we now understand that online is something that we do need to do because, you know, certainly in 2021 this year, we are not going to be over this COVID-19. So for those schools that are going to be only on online, we actually do need the South African Schools Act to be amended. And so what is happening is that for the online schools that pre presently exist, they're using their registration under the South African Schools Act, but actually now it's time for us to actually have a clear, simple regulatory system that actually governs online schools. Um, I would imagine if I were representing teachers, if I were a union leader, if I were Mugwena Malaleka or whoever, um, one of the things that I'll be suggesting to government right now is that we know that there should be around about one and a half million doses of COVID-19 vaccines that will be available and they'll go to healthcare workers. After that, there might be a suggestion that teachers should perhaps be next. I mean, would you support such a proposition, such a motion? Actually, you're absolutely right, uh, Stephen. Actually, internationally, that's been the trend as well. So teachers are being viewed in many countries as frontline workers after health workers. And I think that those in the health system certainly have to take pri uh, priority. But after that, I think that teachers need to do so. And I do know that certainly that uh, the Director General has indicated the cost that COVID-19 has, uh, has really placed on public school teachers. So I really would, we would support that. And I think it's important for that to be put on the agenda that really after uh, um, frontline workers and health services, educators are able to be, uh, to also um, benefit from getting the vaccine quite quickly. Thanks very much indeed. Executive Director of the Independent Schools of Southern Africa. I really do appreciate the time this Saturday afternoon.